Okay, so next let's take a look at our configuration example for MPLS traffic engineering. And first let's talk about the topology, uh, what is pre-configured. So to start we have our uh, core of the network, same as our previous examples with layer 3 VPN, where the core of the network is going to be made up of this, uh, these six nodes. We have three iOS XR boxes and three regular uh, iOS boxes. Okay, on router 1 and XR1, both of these have a connection to customer that is running in uh, VRFA. And then from router 3 over to router 7, uh, we have another site that is for VRFA. And then we have two sites that are for VRFB, which are down on router 2's connection to router 10, and then to router 8, and then also to uh, XR4. Now we'll see that with the specific configuration of MPLS TE, it does not directly relate to layer 3 VPN or to layer 2 VPN. It's simply a method that we're using to label the core of the transport network, same as we would be running LDP or same as we would be running BGP. So what I mean by this is that the edge configuration of the PEs that are running either layer 3 VPN or layer 2 VPN doesn't have anything to do with TE. So we can have some portions of the network that are using LDP for labeling, other portions of the network that are using TE. As long as the label switch path is end-to-end, -end, that's our only requirement for configuring the upper layer applications of MPLS. Now, as we looked at our configs with LDP or configs with BGP, the same verification is going to be used here in traffic engineering, is that if I'm configuring a TE tunnel from router uh, 1 over to router 3, the basic verification for this is that we want to do a trace route from the source of the tunnel, which is going to be normally the loopback interface, to the destination of the tunnel, which is likewise the loopback, and we need to make sure that it's following the MPLS label switch path. If for some reason there's a break in the label anywhere in the core of the network, the end result of that, as we saw in many examples before with L3 VPN, is that the end-to-end -end customer traffic is going to get black holed. So for now, the VRF configuration, the BGP configuration is kind of to the side. We're just looking at the core labeling to make sure that we can get a path like from router 1 to 3, router uh, XR1 to router 3, et cetera, in order to solve the basic uh, label switch path. Okay, so let's now take a look at this from our CLI point of view. So starting at uh, router 1, let's take a look at what the current state of the topology is. So if I'm trying to establish a label switch path over to router 3, this assumes that I have a basic IGP router, some sort of route in order to reach uh, that particular destination. Now we will see as uh, kind of a side note about traffic engineering, the actual routing of traffic and the traffic engineering process are completely separate from each other. So think of TE as just an interface that we're configuring, like we're configuring interface gig 1 or interface tunnel 0 for GRE. Once the interface is up, we still need to configure some sort of routing, whether it's static routing or dynamic routing, in order to actually point the traffic out at the tunnel. And the same is going to happen here with TE. So unless I have some sort of like ISIS route, like in this case, or maybe a static route in order to get to the tunnel destination, I may, able, I may be able to establish the tunnel, but we won't actually be able to use it. Okay, so in other words, we want to make sure that we can ping the destination before we actually go to uh, set up the tunnel. Okay, so next we're going to, again, enable TE globally. So we say MPLS traffic engineering tunnels. We're going to configure this under the routing process. So if we look at show run uh, section router, in this case we are running ISIS as our IGP. So we're going to have uh, metric style wide, which in this case was already enabled because we were doing multi-topology routing. So under ISIS1, we'll say that we have MPLS uh, traffic engineering enabled. We need to set what is the level, which in this case we are doing level 2 routing. So we'll say we're running TE for level 2. And MPLS traffic engineering uh, router ID is going to be our uh, loopback. Okay, so this is a little bit different than in the case of LDP, where LDP is normally going to pick your loopback automatically. If you do not set this in the case of traffic engineering, you cannot participate in the TE topology. Basically, shortest path first fails. You won't be able to do any calculation unless you set the, uh, the router ID manually. Okay, we'll see logic on iOS XR is going to be pretty similar to this. So let's take a look at the XR documentation. 
So from main documentation, let's go to products to iOS, to iOS XR, and then to, not XRV, just regular iOS, the regular XR. Again, fig guides, and then we are running 5.2, so this is going to be 5.2 or 5.3, either one, under MPLS configuration. Okay, so again, notice here that this is separate from the L3 VPN or the L2 VPN documentation because this is talking about the core transit reachability, not the applications that are running on the, uh, the provider edge. So we have implementing RCP for traffic engineering and then also implement, implementing MPLS TE. Now we'll see from a syntax point of view, if we just look at their basic example of configuring uh, TE, it says first you go to global RSVP, so this is saying like the router RSVP process, specify what interfaces that we're enabling the process on, and then set what is the maximum bandwidth that is reservable on the link. Now we'll see that both in regular iOS and in XR, this step is very important because by default, if you uh, just enable RSVP in iOS XR, it gives you a zero uh, bit per second value reservation on the interface. So it means that if you signal the tunnel with no bandwidth constraints, then you're going to be fine. But as long as you say, I want at least one kilobit per second, XR is going to reject this, says that there's no bandwidth or zero bandwidth available on that particular link. So depending on what the questions say in the specific exam, they may tell you what specific bandwidth value to use. But otherwise, you can just say 100% of the interface, like 1 gig or 10 gig, whatever the physical or logical interface uh, is. Okay, then we're going to go to the traffic engineering process, which is basically the, uh, the same type of config. So if we look at their uh, okay, building the MPLS TE topology. So this says go under MPLS traffic engineering, specify the interface. Then under the routing process, we're going to specify what area we're running, what router ID, or likewise with, uh, with, uh, with ISIS. So again, in the case of XR, assuming that you had already configured IGP, you can pretty much just almost uh, copy and paste your IGB config and then uh, specify the same interfaces either under the RSVP process or under the TE process. Well, actually both uh, between them, under RSVP and under uh, TE. Okay, so back to regular iOS. Now we're going to enable this at the link level. So if we take a look at router one, we have three different interfaces facing towards the core that we're going to be running TE on. So on interface gig 111, or one, uh, 111, we say MPLS traffic engineering. Uh, tunnels, that's going to turn it on. And then we need to say IP RSVP. And then how much bandwidth do we want to allow to be reserved for uh, the TE tunnels? Now, in the case of iOS, if we leave this alone and then look at the show run interface gig one 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 one, we see RSVP is enabled. And if we look at the show IP RSVP interface, gig one, 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 one. It says that the interface max is 750 meg, which is 75% of what the physical interface bandwidth, which is one uh, gigabit uh, per second. So point being here, in the case of regular iOS, you don't necessarily need to specify the bandwidth. It's going to give you 75% of what the physical bandwidth keyword is on the interface. But in the case of XR, if you do not do this, it's going to give you a, a zero reservation. But we'll see a little bit later when we look at troubleshooting. That's really only going to matter if bandwidth is actually a constraint of the tunnel. Okay, so let's look at the port level here. And we're basically going to take this same config and then just put it on our other interfaces. So on interface gig 1, 112, which is these two guys, and then gig 1.12. Uh, okay, in the case of XR1, I actually want to start uh, from scratch here. So let me do a commit replace. We're going to delete its config, and then let me put its initial config uh, back in. Okay, like I mentioned, in, in terms of initial configs, there is the zip file there that is uh, part of the, uh, the, the class file share that has these configs that I am uh, using. So in the case of XR1, let's look at what it is doing here specifically. Let me commit the config. And then let's look at what we're doing. So we have our VRS configured. We have two uh, routing tables, A and B. 
At the link level, we have both IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, we have the interfaces in the core, which are going to be uh, these ones here, like towards router 2, towards router 1. We have the customer-facing interfaces that are in VRFs A and B, uh, respectively. And then in terms of routing, if we look at the show run router, router ISIS, we have ISIS enabled on all interfaces in the core. Metric style is already wide because in this case we're running multi-topology. We're running both IPv4 and IPv6. But again, if this was not pre-configured, that is a constraint of, uh, of traffic engineering with ISIS. You need to enable metric style wide in order to allow for the additional uh, constraint attributes, like the available bandwidth. Okay, so if we look at the show IP route, we should already have our IGP routes to the core. So like in this case, we're trying to get to, let's say, uh, router 3. Okay, so again, config is going to be uh, similar here in logic to I iOS, but of course, uh, different steps. So globally, we're going to configure RSVP, and then we specify what interfaces we're going to enable this on. So again, as I mentioned, the shortcut for this would be to look at the, the ISIS process. And then any of these interfaces, we're basically going to enable uh, RSVP on as well. So let me parse some of this output. We're going to say it's on interface 111, 211, and then 112. Okay, so this is under RSVP mode. Okay, the same under MPLS tra uh, traffic engineering mode. So same interfaces. If we look at the show config, normally these two are going to be equal. So this here is the equivalent of enabling LDP on the interface, but the RSVP is the one that's actually doing the signal signaling, so it needs to be a, on a one-to-one -one basis between uh, the two configs. Okay, the other portion, again, is under the global routing process. So under router ISIS, in our case, this is process number one. We want uh, MPLS. Actually, this would be under, I believe, under the AFI, under address family IPv4, MPLS traffic engineering. The router ID is going to be our loopback. And then the level, in our case, is uh, level 2. Okay, so we'll see that you can run it for both levels at the same time in the case that we're doing inter-area TE, which, again, we'll come back to later today and uh, talk about. Okay, so overall, there's not too many steps. It's more an issue of just making sure that you're accurate, enabling it on all of the interfaces. If you miss one of the links, then there's going to be a problem when we actually go to calculate uh, the TE tunnels. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and commit uh, the config. Okay, the rest of the boxes in the middle, I already have this pre-configured on because it's basically the same config, repetitive, over and over and over. We're just enabling TE on all of the, uh, all of the ports. Okay, next step then, before we actually configure the tunnel, is we want to know, do the rest of the routers properly have TE configured? Now, as we saw before, both in OSPF or in ISIS, since we're in the same area for OSPF, we're in the same level for ISIS, all of the routers should have the same input to SPF, which means they have the same output of the shortest path tree. Or in other words, if I look at the TE database on router 1, it should be identical to looking at the TE database on XR1, 2, or 3. So basically, from any point in the area or any point in the level, when we look at the show MPLS traffic engineering topology, we should see that this output is going to be identical between all of the boxes. And if we take a look at just the first output here, it, it says we have a router in the, the area or in the uh, level, more specifically in this case, that has the traffic engineering identifier of 1111, or in other words, this is router 1's liveback. We see some of the other constraints, like what are the interfaces that have the process enabled on, and then what are the specific attributes of this. So what is the IGB metric, in this case meaning ISIS, and then what is the traffic engineering metric. What this then means is that we can make a decision based on TE metrics separate from IGP. But likewise, if we were to say the ISIS cost is 20, this is likewise going to affect the TE cost. So we can configure them together by modifying IGP, or we can configure it separate just by configuring the TE metrics. We'll see the attribute flags are talking about the link color, or what we call the link affinity, to say I want to choose interfaces that are red and blue but not uh, green. Okay, then the uh, amount of bandwidth that is physically on the link, and then the amount of bandwidth that we can total uh, reserve. We'll come back to this in more detail later where we have eight different classes of bandwidth that we can reserve. 
and then out of this we have a subpool of reservation that's going to be used for uh, TE when we're doing uh, diff serve aware. So basically, when you want to say like I have voice traffic that is more important than the best effort traffic, we're going to reserve the voice traffic out of this subpool to make sure that the link is not oversubscribed, like from a low latency uh, queuing or a priority queuing point of view. But by default, with iOS, like I mentioned, it's going to take 75 percent of what is the physical uh, bandwidth of the interface, which in this case is one uh, gig. Okay, if we go down a little bit further to our local node here, which is uh, going to be 11, 11, 11, okay, which is XR1, notice here that it says the global available bandwidth is zero. This again is the potential config error you could get into with iOS XR. If you don't specify for RSVP what bandwidth value is enabled or what bandwidth value is uh, allowed, then when you go to do a reservation, the path calculation is going to fail. Okay, what this should look like if we take a look at like XR2 and we show run, uh, show run for RSVP is normally you would just put whatever the bandwidth of the interface is. Okay, in this case, we'll say that each of these uh, logical interfaces has a gig available. But from XR1, if we do, do the same thing, show run RSVP, none of these are uh, have any bandwidth allocated. Okay, so let's add this command in here. We're going to say the bandwidth, and the bandwidth we can say is uh, simply one gig. In regular iOS, you have to specify that in kilobits per second. So in our case, that would be one million for uh, one gig. Okay, add the bandwidth, commit the changes, and then let's show MPLS traffic engineering topology. We can also sort it by a particular router. So in this case, 11, 11, 11, 11 is the local guy. But if we were to compare this to any other box in the core, like let's say on router 3, router 3 basically should have the same output here because they're in the same level, equivalent of the same area for OSPF. We should know about what are all of the links that they have traffic engineering enabled on. What neighbor are they adjacent with being from an ISIS adjacency or from an OSPF adjacency point of view? And then again, what are the attributes? Attributes being what's the total bandwidth, how much can we reserve, how much actually is reserved, and then other things like the IGB metric versus the traffic engineering metric, uh, the shared risk link group, and then the attributes flags, which again would be the, uh, the link color. Now, from a uh, overall verification point of view, this is great that we can look into the, the individual details of every node and every link, but it's going to be a lot of information to sort through when we're looking at a lot of nodes in the topology. So there's a shortcut that you can use here to figure out, do all of the nodes have traffic engineering enabled, and do they have, an do they have it enabled on every single link? Where basically what we want to parse out of this output is what is the traffic engineering router ID, which is the MPLS TE ID, and then also what is the interface address. So what we're going to do is to say show MPLS traffic engineering topology, but we're going to pipe to include the, and actually let me do this, let's say terminal length is like 10, show MPLS traffic engineering topology because this is a lot of output, and then I want to say to Type to include MPLS TEID or, so pipe again, or interface address. Okay, so now we have a pretty concise output of, of what are all the nodes that have it enabled and then what are the different links that they have it on. So if we now take this output and compare it to the topology, we can just mentally check off what devices have it enabled on what particular interfaces. So starting here over on uh, XR1, which XR1 is going to be the identifier 11, it says there's three interfaces that this node has it enabled on. So 211, which is this one, 111, that one, and then 1112, which is this one. So so on and so forth, you want to figure out does the node have it running, and then what are the particular interfaces that the node has it on. Again, the reason why you need to know this before you configure the tunnel is that if the adjacency is not established or the bandwidth is not reserved uh, at the interface level, when you actually go to signal the tunnel, the path calculation is going to fail or the actual label allocation, which is going to be the RSVP 
uh, path and reserve messages are uh, going to fail. So here we'll look at it as a basic working example and then come back later and look at what are the different problems that we can uh, run into. Okay, so next we're going to configure the actual tunnel. Let's say now we're going to create a tunnel that is going from router 1 over to router 3. And we're not going to configure any constraints of it. So we'll say whatever dynamic path router 1 can figure out, this is basically going to be the same as the ISIS path. We're going to use that for the TE tunnel. And then likewise from XR1 over to uh, router 3. Okay, so if we look back at the documentation example, after we configure the network to prep for the TE config, okay, which was this. So at the link level, we have TE on, we have RSVP on, and then globally we have TE on also under the routing process. Okay, now is to configure the tunnel from the head end, head end being where the tunnel is sourced from. So in our case, this is going to be router 1 pointing outbound towards 3, XR1 pointing outbound towards router 3. So we configure a tunnel interface. We specify that the tunnel mode is going to be MPLS traffic engineering. Okay, so the tunnel mode is not GRE, GRE being the default. The tunnel destination, that's who we're trying to calculate to, and then where we're sourcing the uh, tunnel from. Normally, it's going to be the, uh, the loopback address. Okay, then the traffic engineering bandwidth, this is going to be a constraint that is not 100% required. The priority we'll talk about later is not going to be required. The path option will be required, though. This is basically saying, how are you doing the calculation? Now, we'll see from a troubleshooting point of view, this last command uh, by saying, I want to choose any path that you have, and I'm not going to put any constraints on it. That is going to tell you, is there a problem with the tunnel signaling, or is there a problem with the tunnel calculation? The difference being that there could be a tunnel calculation problem, like the color of the link is wrong where it's red and it's supposed to be blue, or the shared risk link group is wrong. The amount of available bandwidth is not enough. But if we do a dynamic reservation with no constraints at all, the only thing it's basically saying is, do you know a shortest path to this destination node? If yes, then you can do the signaling and the setup. Okay, so from router one, we're gonna create this tunnel. Okay, the tunnel destination in our case is gonna be router three. So we'll say interface tunnel zero, and let me make sure I don't have this tunnel configured first. Okay, so no tunnel. Interface tunnel zero, I'm gonna start by shutting the link down. Okay, why I'm doing that is gonna make a little bit uh, more sense later when we go to do some advanced uh, troubleshooting. We'll say the tunnel is gonna be unnumbered for, from the loopback. The tunnel mode is gonna be an MPLS TE tunnel, so MPLS traffic engineering. The tunnel destination, in our case, is router three. And the uh, path option, so the tunnel MPLS traffic engineering path option is going to be, uh, we have to give it a number, and then this is going to be dynamic. So the number here is basically a sequence number that you can have multiple uh, path options at the same time, where you can say, I want a path option that's going to go explicitly and not go through router 4. But if router 4 has to be in the path, then we can fall back to a dynamic option that just says choose any uh, that are available. Okay, so pretty basic configure, only a couple commands. Okay, next we're going to go to the tunnel and we're going to no shut. And what we're looking for here is the line protocol to come up. If the line protocol comes, if the line protocol comes up, this means two things were successful. First off, path calculation was correct which means I was able to find the destination in the shortest path tree, and I was able to meet the constraints. Again, constraints being like, how much bandwidth do I want to reserve? What are the color of the links? What are the shared risk link groups? Then I was able to actually signal. So I sent the RSVP message out. It goes all the way to the end of the tunnel. Router 3 says, yes, I can set the tunnel back up. It re uh, replies back with the path message, which is going to be the actual allocation of the label. 